Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 436 of the podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. As you can hear, I'm a little under the weather this week. Our daughter Zosha has been in daycare, and those daycare germs are no joke. We've been sick for like weeks, it seems like. But this week was the week I lost my voice. In this episode, guest host Garth Johnson talks with Joy Brown, Kate Wallman, and John Neely about wood firing and how it complements their creative vision. This was recorded live at the Envision Woodfire North Carolina Conference, which happened at Starworks in May of 2022. If you're interested in finding out more about the research that's being done at Starworks, you can visit their website. That's starworksnc.org. Also wanted to take a minute and thank the folks that have donated to the podcast. We are listener supported, so I'd like to thank Sean O'Connor, Tanya DeYoung, and Mariki. Reese Behrman. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing your name, but I appreciate your support as well as the other folks that kick in on a semi-regular basis to keep this podcast going. If you're interested in supporting the show, you can do that on the website. That's talesoveredclayrambler.com slash donate. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. morning right now. The sun is peeking through. We call this in Syracuse, New York, a sunny day. <laughs> um, I would like to welcome all of our asynchronous listeners, listeners from Tales of a Red Clay Rambler, who are joining us via the magic of podcasting. So we're going to get a long tail, I think, for this, this uh, talk. I have with me uh, Joy Brown in the center. Sculptor, lives in Kent, Connecticut. Right next to me, I have Kate Waltman, who is right here in Seagrove, North Carolina. There in, <laughs> in Seagrove. We are in Star, North Carolina right now at beautiful Starworks. And on the end, I have the eminent John Neely, Logan, Utah, uh, professor at uh, Utah State University. So to kick things off, you know, we just had Linda Christensen uh, give a talk that was essentially about the topic of our talk, why would fire? And we got, a, she stepped on all of my lines. So we could take a vote right now. We could all just kind of bop downstairs and uh, watch Ben and Mark. Uh, but honestly, uh, they have beautifully left some time where we will all be able to have a conversation, and still have some time to watch Ben and Mark. Uh, oh, and to introduce myself, I'm Garth Johnson. I'm the Paul Phillips and Sharon Sullivan Curator of Ceramics at the Eberson Museum. And tomorrow night for the plenary session, I'm going to use my bully pulpit to give a little talk on Eberson 101. The Eberson is the taproot of American ceramics, and up until my hiring about four years ago, had been dormant for about 20 years. And the previous curator at the Everson was Barbara Perry, who is now a North Carolina hero and spent a lot of time at the Mint, and especially advocating for the wood fire community and North Carolina potters. And believe you me that she has been in my ear about North Carolina potters and making sure that they're represented. Uh, a few caveats. Uh, I am a trained China painter who has been invited to this wood fire <laughs> conference. And I thank everybody for their patience and for uh, their persistence. Uh, throughout even talking to people last night, I've sort of had John Neely as uh, like a G Jiminy Cricket on my shoulder. Uh, I was describing to uh, Hideo the, uh, onag the world's largest onagama kiln in Grass Valley, and John was like, it's an aborigama. <laughs> so John, thank you. You are keeping me on the straight and narrow, and it's a learning process. So thank you, everybody. But I want to say, you know, I, I do my I do my 
research. And one of the things that I've spent some time doing in the coming weeks before this conference is uh, one of the great ceramic resources in this country lives at the Ceramics Research Center at Arizona State University. Sadly, that institution is only available by appointment right now and needs people to advocate for its continuation. But the entire archives of Studio Potter magazine are there at, at the Ceramics Research Center. And one of those amazing resources are audio recordings, over 500 cassettes made by Jerry Williams over the course of 30 years with Studio Potter. And so I can sort of time travel to visit all of these potters, visit all of these events, and there are two different wood fire conferences that are in these archives. And we're working with Studio Potter. Uh, I'm hoping that at some point the digitized archives will be available to the public and to scholars. But if you want to study them, you can go to Arizona State University to do it. Uh, but there are two wood fire conferences that are recorded by Jerry Williams, and they're very, very different. There was one, and John, I don't know if maybe you were at this, but there was one that was held at the Japan Society in New York City, I think in the late 1980s. And it's very interesting. It's sort of marshaled over by one of the curators at the Asian Society, who is a deep, deep expert in Japanese ceramics. And then, uh, hi, Bruce, uh, there's another one from the early 90s from Peters Valley. And that's a very different animal. So at this Peters Valley conference, and I think there are six or seven 45-minute cassettes that I've kind of skipped through a little bit. And it is all people comparing kilns. <laughs> so I want to get that out of the way uh, right away. So uh, I wanted to ask everybody to talk briefly and in as pornographic terms as possible, I would like you to lovingly describe like your current uh, your current squeeze when it comes to kilns. And John, maybe we, I, I know that you can uh, step to this. Do you want to do you want to set the tone for this and lovingly describe the kiln you fire in? Well. I guess I am uh, polyamorous in that sense. <laughs> um, and part of the reason I find it fascinating is firing different kilns and firing uh, different clays and doing, you know, comparing notes between all those, thing, those things. That would be my, my uh, uh, immediate answer is I like them all. <laughs> the question is now how can I get good work out of each one of them? Um, there are a few pictures uh, in there of uh, our setup at Utah State, which show, um, I mean, we have, uh, I think, seven wood kilns right now, and they're all different. So um, they're all worthy of investigation. Many of you have gone to check them out for yourself. Uh, um, so... Uh, I will welcome you to do your own exploration at uh, Utah State. Uh, Joy, can can you tell me yeah. about uh, the kiln that you primarily fire in? Um, <laughs> the love of my life is one kiln, one anagama. <laughs> um, I built in 1984, and I've been working with anagamas for 48 years with a similar kind of kiln with my teachers in Japan, and um, it's a 30-foot long tunnel kiln, four feet wide, about four feet high, yeah. and we fire for about nine days. And <laughs> <laughs> Okay, all right, I'm, I'm feeling it. <laughs> uh, Kate, would you like to, uh, you have a, a rather unique uh, uh, Position yes. Think. Well, uh, I had a beautiful, massive anagama. Ooh, tell me. Mm. Uh, it was 30 feet long. It was seven <coughs> feet wide at the firebox, and it was six and a half feet tall. And I lost it in a divorce. Oh. So uh, about two years ago, uh, this all happened to me, and this wonderful community here in Seagrove scooped me up. So now I'm on Anne Partina's firing team in a burry box. I get to fire a big stepped chamber kiln with Ben Owen. And I've also gotten to fire with David Stemfley and his lovely Anagama. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is amazing. I think, you know, there's a lot of research that's coming to light about 
trees and the sort of sentience and interconnection of trees. And so I, I didn't even, as I started to kind of say this off the cuff, think about the fact that, you know, you wood firers are cutting these trees down. Linda showed a, um, a slide of the scream being inside of the tree rings of a tree. But, uh, you know, trees can communicate with each other and uh, in this sort of very empathic way and, and are connected. But the wood firing community is very similarly uh, for better, for worse, and for mostly better, is a very interconnected, sort of dendritic uh, society. So I think your story, Kate, very much illustrates that. Um, all right, so I mentioned the Studio Potter archives, and Joy is like starting to cringe a little bit. Joy, there are there are two interviews with you in these Studio Potter interviews. This this must be the surprise you were talking oh, about yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> he wouldn't so, tell me. No, no, I wouldn't tell you. But uh, so, Joy, I think were both of the interviews that you sat for um, with Jerry Williams. Uh, I think so. Okay. Yeah. yeah so like a hundred years ago, right? Like, yeah. Like so eighties um, or something. Definitely, yeah. the first time was when you were living in the Hudson Valley yeah. and yeah. Uh, uh, in the sort of axis of Paul Chaliff, and yeah. uh, and so there there are two forty five minute interviews that are great, but um, I, I listened to them and they're wonderful. And there was there were several moments in both of these interviews where Jerry has sort of essentially asked you the same question that we're talking about. So we're going to time travel. And I'm going to treat you to a, a Joy interview from probably the 1980s, where you're oh answering this question. <laughs> Let's see this if I can. Boy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Be very careful when you invite an archivist type to uh, um, to an event. All right. Let's see if I can get this cranked up enough to uh, share with the viewers here and the viewers at home. Really nice. <clears throat> One of the main things I learned in Japan was. Um, you know, how to think about what I do and how to see, you know, <clears throat> and that, um, you know, it's kind of like a sacred thing we do. You know, it's a, um, it's a, an expression of the spirit and, um, <clears throat> you know, how to do that honestly, you know, with earnest intention and, um, you know, concentration and, uh, awareness, you know, like how to change with it and, um, <clears throat> the whole thing about, you know, that the things you're making are not that significant. They're like points on a, a line, you know, that make up a whole line. It's really the process. And, um, <clears throat> you know, what what I learned in doing pottery, in making pottery and in this discipline is, um, you know, it's like all the parts of me kind of come together, you know, the, the physical, the intellectual, the spiritual, the emotional, you know, it's, it, it develops and brings all those parts together, you know, kind of integrates, it makes you more whole, you know, and anybody who does pottery knows that, you know, it's like, and <clears throat> that, that, um, and then the pieces you make reflect that, you know, that, and you can see, you know, where you are along the line of that process. Okay, so, you know, we Lots just... of ums, um, um, <laughs> um, um, and then a uh, potter's cough. <coughs> So uh, ums aside, you know, I'm someone who loves humor. I love to be a little bit snarky, but I teared up when I heard you saying that. And, you know, this very earnest statement of kind of, you know, the reason while we're here with you just kind of privately talk, talking with you and, you know, uh, Jerry Williams and uh, a, a recorder, your line, your continuum that you've been making these things on has been gotten a lot longer <laughs> since this interview. But would you care to reflect from kind of the other side of uh, listening to yourself uh, uh, say these things? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, as I've grown older, I'm realizing, you know, I can't stoke the kiln 12-hour shifts anymore, and I can't split all the wood and chainsaw up the logs anymore, and I do as much as I can, and also um, I've been led to pay more attention to the spirit in which things are done, and Linda, you referred to that too, like the, the captain kind of creates a energy field, like a sphere, uh, a, um, a space that has the right um, presence and 
I believe that quality, the quality of our presence that we bring to the firing, to making pots, to whatever we do, is reflected in the work. And so as I get older, I can see myself, you know, while my dear friends are stoking my kiln, I'm sitting there watching kind of a bigger picture, like a whole energy field. And we put a lot of energy into um, choosing the people who go on which shift, you know, certain, trying to align with people's skills and interests and um, putting people together. You know, there's just a whole realm of preparations we make in the firing for that, um, to, to help that energy field. Um, I'm kind of doing the same thing. <laughs> so I think that's incredibly beautiful and, and very, very well said. Um, John, I'm going to turn it over to you a little bit. To you, you're someone who's traveled the world, uh, has fired and participated in, um, you know, learning by making in lots of different situations. Would you care to sort of reflect on those sentiments through your travels and your investigations into kilns and wood firing? Um. <laughs> How do I address that? Uh, the, I, I find it endlessly fascinating. My initial impetus for firing with wood was my um, lack of funds. I mean, it was strictly an economic choice initially. Now, I, I can't say that either because the first kilns I built were um, and fired were uh, an investigation of the history of ceramics. Um, but when it was, came time to set up my own studio, that was the driving thing was the money. Um, and so, I mean, I'd have, to, I'd have to say that that's been important. And I've also always been interested in um, finding some sustainable way to do what it is we do. We will not have fossil fuels for the rest of, um, you know, all, for all eternity we have to have something that is renewable. And wood firing um, is, in the big picture, um, has the potential to be a um, sustainable way to, um, to harvest solar energy. So that's driving it, that's in my mind too. But then there's this other thing about um, uh, the, I mean the best justification is probably aesthetic. You can do things with a wood kiln that you can't do any other way. And that um, ultimately is what I find so fascinating as I've fired these kilns all over the world. Um, you know, we're getting things that wouldn't happen otherwise. And Kate, I think you know, you've got to be at a juncture in your career and a kind of rough age uh, that is similar to uh, that recording that Joy made. And would you care to reflect about the utopian uh, um, kumbaya <laughs> elements of, of wood firing. Absolutely. So the first studio I ever worked in, the first year I worked there, I was 14 years old and we built a wood kiln. So wood kilns to me have been part of the studio process from the beginning, right? And that uh, of course, it's about aesthetics, but it's as much about community, too. I mean, uh, it's been kind of funny. I've gotten to see people who live, I don't know, less than two miles from me that I, I would never see otherwise at this conference. And um, having those connections with kilns or being on firing teams with them really holds us together as a community in many ways. So I think that leads to another observation and question that I had. And I had this amazing transcendental curator experience when I was at the Ansika conference in Sacramento. Uh, I hope that some of you got to go to Sacramento. There was an incredible exhibition that was a version of the exhibition that was put on uh, in Santa Barbara about the work of Don Wright's and the creme de la creme of this Don Wright's work from this career spanning uh, exhibition was brought to Sacramento and put up in a really terrific gallery. And I teach. I've got a side hustle teaching at Syracuse University, and I teach a 
ceramics and the digital image course. <laughs> and I think I'm constantly struggling with getting students to look deeply and to, to, to use sort of um, deep investigation with their hands and to tie it all together. And I was marveling at these Don Wright spots and I was wandering around this exhibition and a group, I think from a community college from kind of a rural area outside of Sacramento. And I, I'm sad that I, I can't remember the name of the professor who heads, who heads this um, college up, but the professor came in with this group of about 12 students and they have a wood kiln and the wood kiln is one of the things that they use to bond all of the students. And I watched these students circulate around the room and ask amazing questions and they were so enthusiastic about these brown 1970s Don Wright's pots that I think even my generation like in the 90s like would have given slightly short shrift to. But I truly think that it was the power of the the wood kiln and the sustained engagement I think with process and community that they were engaged in as a group that allowed them to do this. So I just wanted to throw that out to anyone. Um, you know, you were, you're all engaged in education in one way or another and helping the next generation toward an appreciation of clay. I was wondering if you had reflections on that experience through your own experiences. I'd like to share something. Um, like wood firing has... I mean, I also grew up with wood firing in my pottery life, and um, it has taught me, I mean, I think I went into clay because I was very shy, and I didn't have to talk to people. You know, I could just, like, <laughs> look at this cool thing I made and, you know, not have to, like, look at people like we are now. And um, it taught me to, I mean, we have to have other people helping to fire a wood kiln. And um, I've learned to you know, collaborate and communicate, um, let go, you let go of your pieces into the fire, you let go when someone else is loading your piece into the kiln or stoking the kiln when you're sleeping. You have to trust in the process and trust the other people that are helping fire. And um, I've had a you know, hard time learning to delegate, you know, and so there's so many life lessons that we learn in wood firing. And um, actually, we, 20-some years ago, a colleague and I started a nonprofit, Still Mountain Center. It's very small, and um, but it's, it's formed to share this kind of value with anybody who comes around the kiln and around the studios. And um, maybe that's it. I think students, uh, when, when they're engaged in wood firing, it, getting the students out of the studio and beyond the idea that the only action that happens is in the studio is literally cooked into the process. Yeah, it's very physical and it's year long. You know, it's a year long cycle where we're preparing the wood, and sometimes people are never coming to put things in the kiln, they're just preparing the wood. I had the wonderful experience of being part of the first group of, uh, it was the Young Wood Fires Symposium at Gulliagard. And we fired five kilns in five weeks, including the big Olsen Embla, the cross draft, the big round kiln, right? So we had to be making all the time. But it was a moment, I think they designed it this way, for all of us that were brought in, it was the Young Wood Fires, right? We were a young group of people making that transition from being students and maybe being, you know, secondary in a studio setting to being professionals. So we sat down the first day. None of us knew each other. We're all from different countries, so it's really intimidating. And uh, delegated who was going to lead which firing, and we each got practice leading a firing, making sure the wood was cut, the shelves were clean, the posts were ready, prepping the work, and it, it was a wonderful experience. But having having access right, to a workshop where there isn't a grand master in charge, right, and we all kind of did this as a collective and supported each other. Uh, so places like Gulligard, I think, can, can give that little tip into professionalism for students. 
I think there are all sorts of um, uh, entryways into ceramics and in a classroom setting, a, a college setting, uh, raku is something that you know is, is fire and smoke and can hook uh, like a young student. Uh, John, can you talk about, you know, you have a lot of graduate students who sort of make the pilgrimage to be able to study at Utah State, but can you talk about introducing undergraduates and first-timers to the, the wood kiln? Yeah, I've said it in uh, other settings many times, but the, the um, students who, in their first wood-firing experience, all of a sudden know what kind of energy the the kilocalories that are required to make a cup hold coffee. That is something that they take with them, whether they um, ever touch clay again, um, they still have that kind of um, uh, knowledge that they have internalized because they had their bodies are on the line. They have to make an effort to do it. And that changes their outlook on the world. One of the amazing discoveries from the tapes that I've told you about was at the Japan Society um, Symposium, and the amazing potter, Mary Rehm, was talking about her own practice. And I was really surprised when she came out with uh, saying, uh, I fire in wood because I understand it. I know about wood and fire gas terrifies me. It's this, you know, mystical thing that's coming from, like, the, the utilities. And uh, I think, you know, what, I'm sure that she reconciled herself to gas eventually, but there, I think, is great truth in this element of us all understanding wood uh, in some way. Would anyone care to pick that one up? I completely agree with the sentiment. I would much rather wood fire my pots. Um, I always joke, uh, I really don't like Instagram and all that stuff, even though I do it. I joke that I like ancient technologies, right? You put wood in, you adjust the air, and heat happens. And it's, it can be so gentle and um, rhythmic, and you're with your pots the whole time. There's a gas kiln, you might go turn it on and I don't know, make more pots, right? The attention isn't there the way it has to be with a wood kiln. So you mentioned uh, efficiency or in a roundabout way, um, but I wanted to talk about efficiency uh, as a strategic uh, initiative and something that wood fires share. And it's interesting that on the stage we have Joy and you talked about your nine day firings in your wood kiln. And then, you know, we, we have John and you've investigated and uh, brought forward the idea of the train kiln, uh, which allows a lot of the same results, but quicker, um, more efficient firings. Um, John, can you, I'll, I'll let you kick things off by talking a little bit about um, this balance of results and efficiency and process. Well, you know, it, it's interesting. The train kiln has turned out to be an efficient uh, way of uh, firing. That's not what my inspiration or what the, the initial impetus was entirely different. Um, I was convinced that, um, that the anagama, um, which um, basically disappeared in the sixth century in Japan, this was, it disappeared because it was, um, uh, denuding forests, and it was not an efficient way to fire. It was supplanted by other kinds of technology. Nonetheless, the kind of visual aesthetics of things that were um, generated by those kilns uh, was uh, unassailable. I mean, it was there was wide agreement that that stuff was really interesting, compelling. So I thought there's got to be a better way to get ash onto pots, and so figured it. If, the, if you have a firebox up high and you can use gravity to put ash on the pots, then we should be able to get um, long wood firing effects um, sooner, quicker. Um, and But I didn't have any idea that it was going to be a really good way to um, burn wood um, efficiently. And because you can control the, the air uh, at various different places in the in the course of a firing, 
it turned out to be an efficient kiln. That was a byproduct. Joy, would you like to talk about, uh, um, can you talk a little bit about uh, actually studying in Japan and exploring the wood kiln um, ecosystem, as it were, in Japan, and then coming to this practice uh, on your own in the United States? Uh, well, I studied pottery in Tamba for a year, and then three years with a wonderful potter Shige Morioka in Wakayama Prefecture. And from the beginning, from Tamba through now, it was an anagama. And Tamba, it was for glazed ware, and Shige made yakishime, unglazed uh, pottery. And there was nothing, no talk about efficiency. Nobody thought it was going to be efficient. And it, it's sort of where I grew up in, and that's kind of all I know. And it, um, you know, we do take the wood, like Linda was talking about, from trees that have fallen, and you know. But um, in Japan, you know, well, this might be a whole different track. But when I was in Tamba, the I was there with another apprentice, and he and I worked in the studio all day, and at night we would go make our own little cups and around the firing for the whole year I was there and he'd been there like two years we never put any wood in the kiln or pots in the kiln and we would help prepare the wood and take the bark from the that had fallen off the wood and gather it and burn it for ash and we'd repair the cotton gloves after the firing for the next firing and it, there was a reverence for natural materials and um that kind of, you know, ties in with, you know, we, we, a lot of us come to this with not a lot of money and, um, we make it work and we also get by, we learn to get by with very little or little in terms of our culture standards. Um, I remember when I made $10,000 one year, I thought of like doing really great. <laughs> um, Kate, anything to uh, add about your own experiences with you know, your polyamorous kiln <laughs> adventures here and uh, the efficient versus the inefficient uh, um, kilns and the trade-off between um, you know, the process and the results with your work? So because I, I have gotten to work with a few different kilns here, um, I'll, I'll brag on Anne Partina for a moment. She has this wonderful burry box, and it is amazingly efficient. Uh, with her, we're firing with all scrap from a factory, uh, which she goes and gets in her little truck, and we all show up and cut it and stack it. And then also uh, windfalls, right? Wood that has come down in storms that uh, she and her husband have gathered up. So that kiln has a, a very ecological feel to me. Um, and of course, she does other things as well. She's sort of my little conscious voice uh, when I'm at the grocery store. Well, that's in a lot of packaging, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and then going to Ben's kiln, I don't know where he gets his wood. I have no sense of that source. It's probably sawmill offcuts. That's pretty common around here, the sawmill offcuts. We are near the Uari National Forest, and there's quite a bit of forestry going on uh, and, and mills happening, and the older style mills, too, where they get that slab wood that comes off. Uh, so that's pretty common. But if you want to see a lovely ecological kiln, go to Blue Hen Pottery. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Amico Brent. For the past 100 years, Amico Brent has been creating ceramic supplies for our community, ranging from underglazes to electric kilns, and they have no plans of slowing down. With over 3,000 products, Amico Brent's top priority is making sure that all of their customer needs are met. From the professional to the student and everyone in between, their high-quality materials enable you to make your best work. To learn more, check them out at amico.com or on Instagram and Facebook at Amico Brent. You can also show them how you use Amico by sharing your work online with the hashtag HowIAmico. We've addressed Japan, and I, I would 
and I was thinking about my own relationship with Japanese culture. I've been through the Tokyo airport, and that was my only、um, like real con、uh, contact with Japan. And I came back with all sorts of green tea sweets <laughs> from the airport.、Uh, but when I look at my own knowledge, my own kitchen, my own pots, there is so much. Nipponophilia、um, built into that.、Uh, I love、um, drinking green tea, sencha out of the you know me,、um, and I think a lot of that comes through the the、uh, kind of sustained contact with ceramic culture that I've you know been privileged to have for the last twenty five years.、Uh, I was wondering. This, the, again, this is one of my open-ended questions, and I'd like to start with John.、Uh, you've had a very sustained relationship with traveling and investigating different Asian cultures, their firing methods, their food.、Um, can you talk about nipponophilia and、uh, the love of、um, Japanese culture、um, as it comes through the the wood firing? Culture for for better and I don't know if you have reflections on any downsides.、Mm, well, it,、um, it's now almost fifty years since I first went to Japan as a student, and、um, it has been a sustained、um, relationship. So it's kind of hard for me to parse out what, what's Japanese. I, I it, it often.、Um, Makes me squirm when I hear people talking about Japan.、Um, well, it's like the the the、uh, the world's largest anagama in Grass Valley. You know, <laughs> I, I feel obligated to kind of. Well, actually, not exactly, but anyway.、Um, gosh, it's such such a part and parcel of my life. I have a hard time sorting it out. And Joy, you, you, know, you grew up in Japan. Yeah, you know there is、um, one thing all of us would fire share is a、um, we're like a point on a continuum of from the past to the future. You know, like here in North Carolina, the Seagrove Potters, or in Japan, in my case, you know, it's my teachers. You know, they were influenced by their teachers, and we know we know their teachers, and so there's power in. Our work, because of that、um, heritage and tradition, if we're aware of it, and、um, or even maybe not, but it's a、um, it very much is in you know my awareness. Like to it connects me to the past, and then the future is sharing you know sharing the techniques and the attitude and the aesthetic. And way of life with the people around us and our young and the young people coming to the fire and、um, yeah, I think it empowers our work too. A, a whole new generation of enthusiasts and a wave of energy is coming into the ceramic community, at least from my、uh, anecdotal evidence.、Uh, so many people. Took pottery classes during the pandemic, and so many people sat inside of their homes and thought about how they could redecorate it and、uh, how the objects within their homes could be improved. And I think this has you know, led to、uh, booms in the online sales. And from almost every potter that I've talked to who engaged with the market during the pandemic, they've had kind of positive things to say about where things are trending. We, you know, we live in a plastic society, and one of my favorite articles written by an artist comes from the late '60s from the artist Eric Gronberg. It was written in Craft Horizons magazine, and he wrote a whole article about you know the new wave of ceramic artists in the late 1960s. And he acknowledged that we live in a Tupperware society and one that is ruled by the automobile. And he laid out a whole vision for you know an honest American. Pottery that reflected our current sort of material values. The fact that we live in such a water bottle disposable society,、um, yet people I think are primed for investigating、um, ceramic objects in a deeper way. How can you communicate 
wood fire to new audiences. Do you all have, you, you've all been in a situation where you've been in a gallery and talking to someone who's never really encountered work like this. Can you give me your elevator pitch for the, uh, the wood fire curious who <laughs> come into a gallery or engaging with your work for the first time? I would say that, um, uh, I mean, I recall that, that image that, that Linda put up of Omen uh, in New York. The quickest way uh, is through the stomach. I mean, <laughs> food um, shared with people um, makes an immediate entree into wood-fired ceramics. Um, I think people are really craving this kind of earth, you know, tactile, visceral experience that we share in wood firing. And um, people are drawn to it. Um, it's like we are so having so much fun. It is so much fun to do wood firing. And we're doing, there's nobody in it other than for the love of it. We're not getting rich on this thing. And it's, you know, people are drawn to people who are doing what they love. And they, it inspires them, us, to do what we love. And um, it's a beautiful thing what we're doing. And people, um, you know, are inspired by that and are drawn to it. You know, like moss to the flame. <laughs> I show people the hot side of the pot. So yeah, uh, it's a little bit of education, right? At what we're doing in a gallery is usually educating people who don't know. I very rarely have a customer who knows what they're looking at, right? So I'll show um, the hot side and describe the firebox and say, so you can see how the ash has hit and run and it's created this serendipity. And then I'll turn the pot around and say, and this is the cold side that was facing the chimney, and, and that'll give them a, a visualization. And then when they go see a wood kiln, they have a greater understanding of what comes out of it. That is a really good point, and I've actually used that very strategy. And by the way, in addition to the exhibitions that Linda plugged, I will say that the Eberson right now is featuring the exhibition uh, Curious Vessels, the Rosenfield Collection, and we are showing uh, over 200 pots from uh, more than 125 makers, including many, many wood firers. And these are uh, pots that are going to be used in a new cafe that the Eberson is building. And I'll put in a plug for my plenary session tomorrow night where I'll talk a little bit more about this project. But I have actually used that with school groups and people who are just encountering uh, work for the first time. There's an amazing Simon Levin that uh, does just that. Um, Linda sort of ended her examination of the field and why wood fire by talking about our tribe and some of our tribal issues. And we've talked a little bit about um, the influence of Japan and its place, I think, in um, the field currently. I, I can tell you, I have sat on grant panels and jury panels uh, with other kind of young curators and anytime work comes up in these panels that no matter how tangential that that smacks of cultural appropriation it becomes a non-starter i think with a certain group you are all whether where you whether you've done it um already or doing it already, John, you're in, in a very academic uh, setting, uh, we are all going to have to be prepared to address, I think, cultural appropriation in our work. And uh, would anyone like to, I'd, I'd love for all of you to talk about that because you all have different and you know very deep relationships with Asian culture. <laughs> it's a very tricky thing with, um you know, appropriation or learning. Like I also kind of squirm when um, we're talking about this, like my study in Japan was, um, you know, in the first apprenticeship was with the 13th generation potter. And we made thousands and thousands of little sake cups all year long, never firing any. And um, it was really a, a training in, 
you know, of course we learn the feel of the clay, the technique, the tools, um, but it was kind of learning an intuitive connection to the clay, not through your head. And so when you carry this, when I came to America, you know, I was a potter. I sold, you know, cups and bowls and tokuri and sake cups. And, you know, that's what I learned. And in Japan, you're kind of, it's how well you follow your teacher. You know, it's a, I learned to value the lessons of a mentor in, in wood firing in Japan. And so, you know, I do believe that if we keep you know, if we keep making the sake cups with, with awareness and presence, it will evolve into your own piece. It's like your signature. You sign your name first on the little lines with, you know, your letters, and then thousands of times it becomes your own. And um, I think uh, some takes longer, so it looks like you're appropriating Japanese um, sake cups or tokuri, but it's part of the learning process. And... Um, you can go, if you go do it long enough, you'll go somewhere else. John? Oh, I totally agree. I think that um, you make things yours by making them. And the, um, you can go down to that exhibition downstairs, and there are people who walk through. There's no, I know immediately. I don't have to have a label. I know whose work that is. And um, when it gets to that point, then you have transcended that, um, I think, the stigma of maybe your influences. And how do you reach the person who isn't willing to go there or engage, uh, who is coming to the idea of cultural appropriation with very fixed um, ideas? How do you transcend that? You mean the potter? The potter or the person? How yes? How how does how does the potter communicate something larger to an audience who is um, hostile to the idea of um, using these techniques and materials? It's hard to overcome that kind of prejudice. I have a I think a very different background, right? So uh, my clay background is primarily academic, and I didn't work in a workshop like you've described. So I talk about. Uh, opening the book of 10,000 years of human activity and looking at it and understanding that, sure, something has an origin, but every time cultures meet, they exchange things. And it's being aware of where something came from and what it means and what it means in that culture and maybe how it's changed in meaning. So probably the only Asian thing I'm doing in my pots, at least from my awareness, is the, the lotus pattern, but that pops up everywhere. I mean, it just, it comes into play in ceramics in so many cultures at so many time periods that I feel like myself using it is more being part of a ceramic community than referencing one that I'm outside of. I would, I would um, uh, add that I'm a firm believer in um, uh, what the agronomists call hybrid vigor. And I think that it is that cross-cultural kind of... Um, engagement that gives rise to new things. You can pick any culture in the world. It has been the result of the interaction of more than one source. And we're all working in a way with the same tool, right? We all have human hands and m many cultures figured out how to spin a wheel, right? And then there's fire. So I did a project um, that, that had to do with um, Paleolithic mobiliary art, and I was I was making pit-fired beads that were based on bead forms in Neolithic um, Europe, and this was just purely for fun, right? Uh, and people kept commenting on how African the jewelry looked in the end, which I was not looking at at all. But then when I started researching that, of course the forms are similar, right? A round bead looks like a round pit-fired bead. It doesn't matter what origin, uh, you know, the picture's coming from. So in some ways, we're, you know, we're all working with the same thing and have been this whole time. I'm so glad that Linda Christensen earlier brought up uh, indigenous pottery and uh, coming to the Northeast. I moved from Tempe, Arizona to Syracuse, New York, and immediately was... Um, 
taught uh, and taken under my wing by Haudenosaunee potters uh, and uh, members of the the different Haudenosaunee nations up in the Northeast. And there's a long and terrific history uh, of um, indigenous pottery in the Northeast. And I would say that when it comes to firing with wood, some of the most interesting investigations are coming at the hands of young indigenous potters who are recovering their own food ways and discovering uh, and rediscovering uh, firing methods and their own clay. Uh, we're working with a potter named Natasha Smoke Santiago, um, who will be featured in the next uh, Ensica, um juried national, which I'm putting together and is com- completely vessel-based, by the way. So look for that call. Um, and I just wanted to um, to mention that and to mention that uh, you should all embrace Linda's call for engaging with that community because I found it to be uh, definitely one of the most vigorous out there. So we've got about 10 minutes and I want to open things up to the audience um, for some questions. Uh, if you ask a question, I will repeat it uh, into the microphone for the benefit of our Tales of a Red Clay Rambler um, visitors. But any of the things that we've talked about um, that you'd like to poke more deeply into or any questions that you'd like to ask our panelists, I would welcome them now. So we just heard from Mark Hewitt, a uh, man after my own heart who can ask a question uh, in the form of uh, like a long observation. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but he, he brought up uh, a recent article in the New Yorker, and there was another one actually in the New York Times, and both were terrific articles that I think were long time coming in actually being in-depth uh, examinations of Simone Lee's very um, complicated uh, um, practice. And... Um, you know, Simone Lee is getting a ton of attention on the international stage. She lived at some point in a uh, um, collective uh, environment and described the craft world as a failed utopia. And this is something that Garth Clark has also, I think, dug very deeply into and has actually delivered like a post-mortem for the crafts movement. But here we are again (laughs) in an interesting cyclical era that I've actually kind of been predicting, I think, for for some time. Um, But I'll open up the question to the panelists. Utopia. Well, I tend to be an optimist. We have to be. And I don't pay attention to that article. (laughs) No, no, no. (laughs) But You know, we have to look at the bright side of things. It is full of hope. I mean, um, like Linda was saying at the end, it's, you know, we're, we're holding up space in, I mean, if you're just talking wood firing, it was so cool to see Josh Copas firing these three kilns the other day. I'm, you know, I'm like been doing this for 48 years and it's, it's so exciting to see somebody else doing it. And people are, um, yearning for this and um you know we we can give it to them (laughs) and it it translates into the work a beautiful cup they put to their lips i mean it's so intimate a connection people are craving and you know so forget that craft um utopia (laughs) (laughs) to your point i think uh we're a thoughtful group of people right crafts people and we think about who's around us And of course, we're a reflection of the society that we already live in, but I think groups like these can start to heal some problems. Well, I I think that's exactly it. We can heal some problems. And I think of, rather than thinking of it as um, the craft community, it's more like appropriate technology. And what I was saying earlier about um, sustainable firing technology, that's appropriate technology that we're, um, as you know, human beings are going to need um, as they run, as we run out of um, petroleum. And I, as a quote unquote scholar, quote unquote historian, I love to think about things in a cyclical way. And uh, I've deeply, deeply studied 
uh, the crafts movement and the Asilomar conference in 1956. And it's amazing how crafts people are great at organizing things and coming together and creating something larger than themselves. We have a movement in 1956. It seems like every major organization like Studio Potter and uh, the Clay Studio in Philadelphia started in the early 70s as a way of sort of magnifying the power of groups in the early 70s. And here we are again, I think. And, uh, you know, Henry Christman is in the audience. Uh, Henry and Ginny have created this terrific new ceramic school in Detroit. Land is cheap. Opportunity is plentiful. And so, uh, you know, I, I think I look through the lens of utopias as being cyclical. They sort of, utopias have uh, um, lifespans sometime. But uh, I hope that everyone here is embracing the moment that that we live in. Uh, five or ten years ago, uh, as someone who's definitely in middle age right now, I marveled at the way that young people graduating from school can make careers, in particular living in um, Arizona or Southern California. Uh, all sorts of people could uh, um, make careers and lifestyles that I never could have imagined uh, when I was going to school. So I think that's a beautiful thing. So I think we have time probably for one more question. Who'd like to lob it at us? And I'm going to repeat the question for the audience at home very quickly. But um, an, an audience member has been wood firing for about six years and has asked a question that actually I, I sort of posed to you last night, Joy, about uh, the fact that you make largely sculptural work and uh, you actually do a lot of very, very large scale work in bronze uh, right now, but wood fire seems to have a very like generative place in your creative process. And can you talk a little bit about the role of you know wood fire with your sculpture and your process? The um, you know my root, it's like a tap root, is in pottery and wood firing kiln. It's an anchor for me and. Actually, being here and seeing this show is like, oh my God, Joy, let's make some pots, you know. But and I always do make a few. So, like, actually, before I became an apprentice, I made like sculptural forms in college, and then that all just was on the back burner for the that time. And I thought this was to make a living being a potter. And slowly on the side, I started to make these little puppet heads and you know they're really dorky looking but it was like fun and gradually more and more energy like going towards what's fun and that you know led me those, those little dorky puppet heads are the ancest the um, ancestors to these figures now it's just it's kind of the, like the sake cups doing it over and over and over and over and they've evolved into something else and and they are now very large and all the skills that I've learned with wood firing allow me to go to China and cast very large pieces in bronze and build the plaster form myself and it's um, it's just sticking to it and going where your heart takes you you know all right, I'm going to wind things up here, and I'd like to thank everybody for getting up and attending these sessions this morning. I want to invite everybody to a presentation that I'm going to be doing at 3.15 this afternoon, I believe, in this space. And I'm going to be talking about, even though I've admitted that I've only been to the Tokyo airport, uh, I'm going to be talking about an, an artist that I'm very, very passionate about, a Japanese artist named Akiko Fujita, who in the mid-1970s started making wood-fired sculptures the size of apartment buildings. And if you want to see rarely seen footage and learn how to make sculptures that are the size of apartment buildings, I'm going to tell you this afternoon. So join me for that. Uh, also, I uh, want to definitely thank our panelists. So John, Joy, Kate, thank you. And those of you in the audience, uh, as we're puttering around and spending this time together, please come tell me about your sexy kilns. I, I definitely want to know. And I'll see you around the conference. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.
I'd like to thank Garth for taking over the hosting duties for this week, as well as Kate, Joy, and John for being on this episode. I did want to take a minute also to tell you about a show that is up at the Everson Museum, which is where Garth Johnson is the curator of ceramics. It's called Curious Vessels, the Rosenfeld Collection, and I got to see this show maybe two months ago, and it blew me away. Louise Rosenfeld, who is a sponsor on the show, has been amassing a collection of more than 4,000 pieces of functional pottery from artists across the globe. This exhibition is a large portion of her collection, as well as being a kickoff of what will eventually be a Everson Cafe called Louise, where you're going to be able to actually use these vessels while you eat at the cafe. It's a fantastic idea for keeping a collection alive and well after it's been donated to a museum. The exhibition, though, is only on display through October the 2nd, so if you haven't gotten a chance to see it and you're in the Syracuse or the greater New York region, you got to go check it out. It's such a good show. You can find out more at the Everson website, which is everson.org. Also wanted to take a minute and thank today's sponsor, Amico Brent. They've been a longtime sponsor of the show, and we certainly appreciate their support. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor on the show, you can get in touch through the network website. That's brickyardnetwork.org. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you all for tuning in. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. We respectfully acknowledge and honor all indigenous communities whose lands we reside on in the United States and recognize that we are uninvited guests on the occupied, unceded, and ancestral lands of over 500 nations indigenous to North America. By acknowledging and reflecting upon the contemporary lived experiences and histories of the indigenous peoples here and globally, we may begin to take essential steps towards creating a more equitable world. Learn more through the hashtag Honor Native Land Initiative of the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture and consider contributing to Indigenous-led organizations doing important work to further health and wellness, sovereignty, and self-determination of the first people of the lands you reside. This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network, an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org.